But David, if fifteen dollars is better than eight, why not pay everybody a hundred dollars an hour? If more money is good, pay everybody a thousand dollars an hour. Well, no, I've spent a lot of my time on this channel dealing with the money and politics issue. And as I've said on multiple occasions, the argument starts from a correct premise. Corporations do have a ton of influence in our politics. That said, the narrative overall has some serious flaws. People within the online left draw a number of incorrect conclusions from the reality of corporate influence, particularly on how it manifests in policy. David Pakman has argued that, by their very nature as profit-seeking entities, corporations are conservative institutions and necessarily push our politics in a free market direction. I know that there are people who say YouTube has an inherently left-wing bias. Others say YouTube has a, a, a right-wing, but whatever. YouTube's bias is towards corporatism and profit. Yes. That's fundamentally what it is. And but as in, a company, they have a left-wing bias. I don't know that. If we want to talk about how the personal politics of the employees translate to policy, we can do that, but we need to be able to make some specific claims about how, how it does. What I'm saying is we know the way in which the structure that Google is a part of leads to it advocating for things that are center-right corporatist capitalist, the status quo of tax shelters, havens, and not paying taxes, regulating ourselves et cetera, et cetera. I have no doubt there are certain businesses that would like a freer market and less regulation, but this is by no means true of all corporations. The fact of the matter is there is no corporate agenda in politics. There are corporate agendas, and they're frequently at cross purposes with one another. Corporations are no different than people in this matter. While it's true that all of them are seeking profit, that doesn't mean that their interests are always the same. This is why they frequently want different things from the government. Even corporations within the same industry oftentimes find themselves at odds with one another in the realm of politics. The online left was actually aware of this dynamic when it came to net neutrality. How do you convince Republicans when they don't care about their own voters? Their own voters are clear on this. They, <clears throat> they want net neutrality, but yet they vote against it because they get donations from those telecom companies. So how do you, how do you win them over when they, when they don't care about the voters? In the last set of fights, uh, you know, where we beat back the forces that wanted to kill net neutrality, a lot of people think, oh, the internet rose up in its fury and it was the activists, etc. That is half true. But also, the cavalry rode in, Facebook, Google, yes. and all these giant companies that do a tremendous amount of lobbying because they have to. That's the system that we have now, right? And they give a lot of money to Democrats, but they also give a lot of money to Republicans. So when they say something, both parties go, wait a minute, now this affects my checkbook, now I'm paying attention. Plus, I got people mad in the streets, yep. right? What was true for net neutrality is true for just about every issue. Remember when the Trump administration levied new tariffs? Definitely not a free market move to tax raw materials and finished goods from other nations. Yet, many companies requested that Trump do just that. United States Steel, Century Aluminum, and Whirlpool all requested that the former president put tariffs on Chinese steel imports, citing unfair subsidies. Westervelt, an Alabama-based lumber company, requested that the former president put duties on Canadian timber. This is not unique to President Trump either. According to a study conducted by Credit Suisse, the United States was the world's most protectionist major economy prior to Trump even taking office. This is an inconvenient fact for the people who think that corporations run everything and just want freer markets. Sadly, this trend will likely continue under the Biden administration. Of course, there were companies that resisted these trade actions. About 3,500 companies sued the Trump administration over the Chinese tariffs, including Tesla, Ford Motor Company, Target, Walgreens, and Home Depot. Those of you who watch this channel know exactly where I stand on this issue, but that isn't relevant right now. The point is that here we see multiple corporations, all of which are fundamentally driven by the profit motive, requesting different things from the government, not all of which bend in a free market or conservative direction. In fact, these businesses that requested tariffs were in line with many in the online left. The whole idea is to revitalize the uh, domestic uh, aluminum market and domestic steel. And that's something I agree with, man. Like, this is a move that I could see Bernie Sanders doing if he was president. Where he's like, okay, yeah, we're going to do a tariff because we're going to, you know, uh, we're going to make it so that American steel and American aluminum it has a priority. And it's less expensive, even though we pay our workers better in those uh, industries. Trade is not a unique issue in this way. 
But why is it that corporations oftentimes find themselves on the same side as people who are frequently hostile towards capitalism? We can find part of the answer in a concept from public choice theory known as bootleggers and Baptists. It explains why when it comes to government regulation, people who are seemingly at cross purposes may have an overlapping agenda, even if everyone involved is not aware of that. As Adam Smith, no, not that Adam Smith, and Bruce Yandel wrote in their book, Bootleggers and Baptists, the theory takes its name from the classic example of laws requiring liquor stores to close on Sundays, which were supported by both alcohol bootleggers and anti-alcohol Baptists with both groups willing to spend valuable resources in pursuit of such laws. The happy bootleggers eliminated competition one day a week, and the devoted Baptists could feel better knowing that demon rum would not be sold openly on their Sabbath day. Of course, no one will ever see bootleggers carrying signs in front of a state house seeking political support when closing laws are up for reauthorization. The point of the theory is precisely that they don't have to. The Baptists lobby state house members for them. For a success to occur, according to the theory, a respectable public-spirited group seeking the same result must wrap a self-interested lobbying effort in a cloak of respectability. Both members of the politicking coalitions are necessary to win. The Baptists enable accommodating politicians to say that the action is the right thing to do and have folks believe them. The bootleggers laugh all the way to the bank and may occasionally share their gains with helpful politicians. The Baptists in this equation need not be religious. They just need to be moral crusaders, doing what they believe to be the right thing. The bootleggers in this analogy need not be criminals. They just need to have more cynical motives than the Baptists. Nor do these two parties need to be directly coordinating. The idea behind the analogy is that you have two different parties striving towards the same goal for very different reasons. Online leftists frequently roll their eyes at corporate virtue signaling. As they should, it's incredibly annoying. Frequently, they take their criticism a step further by suggesting that corporations are their enemies, fighting against everything they want. Hence, the virtue signaling is just a distraction from the real issues. Basically, the move is, hey, cor us corporations will give as much ground as you want on, I on identity stuff. We'll say, you want us to take a knee, we'll take a knee. You want us to say Black Lives Matter, we'll say Black Lives Matter. You want us to get rid of anything that's uh, questionable or problematic, we'll do that. You want us to have white CEOs express their white guilt a thousand times a day, we'll do that too. But just don't you dare look at the fact that we have Vietnamese child labor making our goods or Cambodian child labor making our goods and that we outsource jobs that were formerly good paying U.S. jobs. Everything is a distraction. Everything is a symbolic gesture and giveaway which nothing hinges on and it serves no purpose except pissing off reactionaries. This isn't necessarily the case. Big corporations are frequently in line with the left on issues a little more concrete than the cultural ones. They frequently lobby for things that leftists like, such as higher levels of regulation. A great example of this is the $15 an hour minimum wage. As I write this video, it looks as though President Biden is going to give the fight for 15 crowd exactly what they want. Progressive activists are thrilled about the prospect of this happening, but I haven't heard many of them mention one of their big allies in this fight, Amazon.com. That's right, the big bad online retail giant has come out in favor of raising the federal minimum wage. President Biden has made clear his support for an increase in the minimum wage, which has been stuck at 725 since 2009. Amazon Global Corporate Affairs Senior Vice President Jay Carney wrote in a blog post on January 26th, passing the Raise the Wage Act would increase incomes for millions of employees and revitalize the national economy. Some of you may recognize the man who wrote that blog post. Jay Carney was one of the White House press secretaries under the Obama administration. So this looks a lot like the sort of Washington swamp story that you would hear about on the Young Turks. You have a gigantic, politically well-connected company that gave a cush job to a former Obama staffer. On behalf of that company, the former Obama staffer is endorsing a policy championed by the current administration, which of course is headed by Joe Biden, the vice president during that same administration. And yet the policy they're endorsing is something that progressives want. So what gives? Well, that brings me back to our boy David Pakman. A couple of weeks ago, David did a story on the CEO of another massive corporation that left his state, McDonald's, saying that his company would be fine if the federal minimum wage was raised to $15 an hour. This new radical, wacky Republican congresswoman, uh, Lauren Boebert, tweeted about the minimum wage, something really dumb. She tweeted, quote, I got my start working at McDonald's. That job doesn't exist if the minimum wage is raised to $15 per hour. Small business would be crushed by this arbitrary mandate and big business would simply automate away jobs. 
Not everything that sounds good is actually good in practice. And what is fascinating is that now it just so happens that the company she mentioned, McDonald's, has put out a statement about this. McDonald's CEO Chris Kamzinski did a fourth quarter earnings call with investors um, on Thursday after we had covered this story. And he said the company is doing just fine in states that have increased minimum wages beyond the federal minimum wage. And we are basically going to be fine. We will do just fine even if minimum wages continue increasing in a variety of different states. Uh, this is what a four year analysis by a team of economists found for McDonald's that in applicable markets where wages have gone up. And as I talked to you about before, D.C. is already 15 bucks an hour. McDonald's is doing fine. California's 13 to 14 an hour. McDonald's is doing fine in California. Uh, Washington state is, I believe it's 1369. McDonald's is doing fine in Washington state and on and on and on. From what I've seen, Laura Boebert is pretty loopy, but she's absolutely right here. And David doesn't really address her points. There are a number of statistics floating around in the ether about how McDonald's could afford to pay their workers a living wage and they would only have to slightly raise their prices on their signature goods. Whenever these uh, companies crunch the numbers like McDonald's, they, they crunch, how much would it we have to raise our prices to raise our wages to $15 an hour. It'd be something like, you know, five cents on every Big Mac and shit like that. Really? I mean, it's so insignificant. Oh, see, that's just crazy. It's, that's it's just crazy. crazy they won't do that. The people who cite these numbers are inadvertently showing a major weakness in their case. Of course, McDonald's will be fine if the minimum wage is more than doubled because they have economies of scale. Here's a clip from a video by a YouTuber named Jacob Clifford explaining why average costs per unit are so much lower for large companies. Think of two bread companies with one producing bread like this and the other one producing bread like this. Now, here's the question. Which one of these two companies has higher costs? Obviously, this one. That's millions of dollars of equipment they're using to produce the bread. So their total costs of producing are way higher. But what about their average cost of producing each loaf of bread? It's way lower. And that's the idea of economies of scale. The long-run average costs fall as more output is produced. Economies of scale is the idea that getting bigger is cheaper. It happens because of increasing returns of scale and other cost-saving measures. Companies that are producing at a larger scale can afford super productive machines and also buy resources in bulk. Again, the total cost might be a lot higher, but the average cost is lower. McDonald's is the largest fast food chain in the country in terms of sales. 99 billion served was an informal slogan McDonald's used to have that dropped off in the late 1990s. They no longer keep exact count on how many customers they've served, but they have far exceeded that old benchmark. Additionally, no one buys in bulk more than McDonald's. This company purchases such large quantities of beef, chicken, and potatoes that McDonald's is practically a commodities trader. McDonald's operates at such an enormous scale, they can cut costs elsewhere that will more or less offset the increase in labor costs. However, their small competitors, mom and pop restaurants, don't operate at that scale and will have to increase prices at a much higher rate in order to stay afloat, which of course puts them at a disadvantage against their larger competitors. Some progressives are actually aware of this, which is why they've called for government subsidies of small businesses to offset cost increases. Now, listen, to be fair to them, their argument is, hey, if you do it, there's going to be widespread job loss and unemployment's going to go up because businesses can't afford it, basically. Assuming for a second that's true, not necessarily true, but let's assume for a second that's true. There are other ways to address that problem. Set up a program to subsidize these small businesses so that they can afford the $15, but they're only subsidized if they keep the workers on at a $15 wage. This strikes me as a convoluted and absurd money laundering scheme, but there it is. There's another reason why large businesses like Amazon are actively in favor of the Raise the Wage Act. Amazon, like McDonald's, operates at an enormous scale and is therefore able to offset labor costs as well. One of the ways they can do that is through further automation. Obviously, automation is inevitable to a certain degree, but the pace at which it occurs will be increased by raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour. If you increase the costs of labor, companies will just replace labor with capital. Like most other things, as time passes, the costs of automating processes eventually gets lower. However, a company like Amazon can still pay the high costs when automating technologies are in their nascence, when they are still prohibitively expensive for smaller competitors. Large capital investments for Amazon are a small portion of their overall operating costs. 
and of course they can write these expenses off on their taxes. The same is not true for most small businesses, especially the first one. This gives large firms like Amazon a distinct advantage over their smaller competitors. The point here is that corporations, especially the big bad ones that leftists like to rag on, are not necessarily at odds with what leftists want. Of course, this doesn't necessarily mean that what they want is the wrong thing to do. Though, at the very least, it really should give them some pause. I'm not the sort of person who fetishizes small businesses either. Large businesses tend to be where they are because they do things better. But that doesn't mean that we should give them a leg up over their smaller competitors. Online leftists, who consider themselves opponents of big business, are very often their useful idiots. They are the Baptists to the big business bootleggers. Mm.